Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? All right. Um, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm Ashish. I'm a PhD student at Georgia Tech, uh, and today I'll be talking about or presenting my doctoral or part of a, my doctoral research uh, that focuses on improving the performance of user file systems. Specifically, um, I'll be talking about how you can use EVPF uh, to improve the performance of Fuse file systems. Um, and before I start, I just want to say that uh, the reason I'm presenting this, is, you know, this way is so that the camera captures me and not my laptop. This is not my presentation style. <laughs> All right, um, so let's get started. Unfortunately, the world we live in is divided, and it's divided into kernel and user file systems, and each has its own pros and cons. Um, for example, kernel file systems give you native performance, but um, they are not easy to develop, they are not easy to debug and maintain. Um, an example would be ext4. Um, on contrast, there are user file systems that provide improved reliability, security, they are easy to develop, debug, maintain, but they offer poor performance. An example would be Gluster, quite popular, and InkFS. So poor performance is going to be the, the focus of my talk today. So with that, uh, let's get into details and talk about uh, Fuse. So what is Fuse? Fuse is a state-of-the-art framework for creating, developing user file systems. All file system requests are served in the user space by a Fuse daemon that has corresponding handlers. For example, lookup, open, read, write, etc. Over 100 Fuse file systems have been implemented, and they span across uh, two categories, stackable and network file systems. So stackable file systems, uh, as the name sounds, it adds incremental functionality on top of uh, underlying host file system. For example, Android SD card FS adds uh, custom security permission checks on top of ext4 file system. On the other hand, there are network uh, uh, fuse file system that serve file system requests by talking to a remote server. So um, for the for the uh, for this talk, we'll uh, restrict ourselves to just uh, the uh, stackable fuse file system. So let's look at the architecture of Fuse. So the most important component here is the Fuse driver. It's in the kernel. It's a thin interposition layer that interfaces with the VFS. And the second component is the Fuse daemon, which is in the user space. It implements all file system handlers to serve requests in the user space. So as applications make, as applications make system calls, the VFS would deliver the request to the Fuse driver. The Fuse driver would simply forward the request to the Fuse daemon, which is in the user space. Um, and if the Fuse file system is stackable, then it would talk to the underlying file system, lower file system, to serve these requests. On the other hand, if the file system is over the network, then it will talk over the network. But for the, like I said, for the, this talk, we'll, we'll restrict ourselves to stackable file system. All right, so let's look at uh, performance of Fuse. So here, the, the benchmark that I'm using is, is Linux compilation benchmark. I'm, using, I'm trying to compile uh, Linux 4.17. The machine I'm using is a quad-core Intel machine, and I'm using SSD. Uh, and there is a particular version of libfuse that I'm using. So x-axis compares native, which is ext4, and fuse performance. Y-axis shows the time in seconds, and it's the build time, time taken to compile the Linux kernel. And as seen, there is about 17.5 for you know, overhead, percentage overhead with fuse. So let's understand why. So for that, um, I think the main cause of the performance overhead in Fuse is the context switch that occurs for every request. And what happens is that when the application is making a, a file system call, for example, uh, open. So the application would do open on mount is where Fuse is mounted. So the application would do mount foo, uh, open on uh, some file, 
then the, the request will be delivered to the fuse uh, driver. And, but the requests that are delivered are, for example, in case of open, the is, uh, internal request is delivered by VFS, which says, okay, this is the path component, and give me the inode for, for this. So that will be the lookup operation. And similar lookup operation, uh, lookup requests will be issued for all path components. So for foo, one for foo, one for bar, and if there are more, then you know, additional requ uh, lookup requests. Such look lookup requests uh, go to the fuse driver, and then there's this context switch that happens. The requests are simply forwarded to the fuse daemon, where the fuse daemon would talk to the lower FS to serve these requests. So as you see, there are multiple context switches for one open request. So let's look at, let's look at the, the number of requests that is delivered to the fuse daemon in case of Linux compilation benchmark. So again, uh, I'm compiling Linux uh, 417, and this graph shows the number of requests. So x-axis will show the type of each request, and y-axis is showing the number of requests in thousands. So as you can see, this benchmark is very heavy on metadata requests. So there are lookup requests, there are get attribute requests, also get extended attribute requests, apart from the, the regular IO read write requests. So what do we, how can we, how can we reduce the number of uh, requests to the fuse daemon? which will in turn reduce the number of context switches. Well, fortunately, Fuse has some, uh, wow, uh, okay. So fortunately, Fuse has some uh, optimization uh, parameters that you could use. For example, um, you can use uh, entry timeout and attribute timeout to ask the fuse driver to cache some of the get uh, attribute requests and get uh, uh, and, and look up requests in the kernel. So, so if the kernel is caching a lot of these requests, then you would assume, you would think, the number of requests being delivered to the, to the fuse team would reduce. Similarly, uh, because the requests are being simply forwarded to the user space where they are served, there is a lot of IO, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, data copying for IO. You can use splice, read, write, move to reduce the number of copies. So let's look what uh, let's look at uh, the performance and you know see what happens when you uh, when you uh, enable these optimizations. So I've enabled these optimizations here. So I've enabled splice. I've enabled uh, I've specified a non-zero entry timeout, which would say okay if there are lookup requests, uh, cache them in the kernel. Similarly, uh, if if there is a get attribute request, because of this non-zero attribute timeout, these requests will be cached in the, or these replies will be cached in the kernel. And again, the benchmark is the same. This shows um, the x-axis will compare native, regular, optimized fuse uh, performance, and this is, again, the build time in seconds in y, on y-axis. So as you can see, the optimizations do not help much. Hmm. Why is that? Okay, so to understand why, let's look at the number of uh, requests that are being, uh, you know, that is being delivered to, to the fuse daemon in each of these cases. So again, x-axis shows the type of request, y-axis shows the number of uh, requests in thousands, and I'm comparing regular fuse and optimized fuse. As you can see, there are four times fewer lookups, which is good because we enabled a non-zero um, entry timer, right? But the number of uh, uh, get attribute requests actually increases. Also, the number of get extended attribute requests is the same. So what's going on? Well, uh, what happens is that when a file is read in the kernel, the A time changes. The fuse driver will change the A time which will invalidate the cached attributes. So next time the request, get attribute re request, uh, or get extended, uh, get attribute request will be, will be um, sent to the user space. Hence the number does not really decrease. It actually increases because it's trying to 
flush out the stale attributes from the kernel. And um, because there is a extended attribute handler uh, implemented in the, in the user space by the Fuse daemon, for every write request, just like the VFS issues um, lookup request for every open uh, system call, for every write system call, there's an internal get, attrib get extended attribute request issued to the Fuse driver by the VFS to read security labels. So you can see the number is almost the same. The number of write requests and the number of get, get uh, extended attribute requests the same. And there is no caching of uh, extended attributes in the kernel right now in Fuse driver. So uh, what can we do? How can we uh, reduce the number of requests in the user space and you know, thereby reducing the uh, number of context switches and increasing performance? Well, enter eBPF. So BPF uh, is a it's Berkeley packet filter. Uh, it's a pseudo machine architecture that was introduced a while back. Um, recently, eBPF uh, extends that uh, the BPF uh, virtual machine architecture, and it's uh, it actually um, introduces um, multiple uh, improvements over um, over BPF, and it has now evolved as a generic kernel extension framework. It's being used by tracing, perf, and network subsystems currently. So let's start with a little overview of uh, eBPF. So like I said, um, uh, it's a pseudo machine architecture. So the extensions are written in C. You can extend the functionality of the kernel at runtime. The extensions will be written in C in user space. Um, there'll be a C program. You compile the C program using uh, LLVM you know, tool chain. There'll be a byte code that is produced. The byte code is inserted into the kernel using a system call. Before that, there's a verifier that kicks in. It checks the integrity, it checks the sanity of the, of the bytecode, you know, making sure there are no um, um, you know, uh, buffer overflows, there are no loops uh, because it's severely restricted, and the bytecode is executed uh, as part of uh, a virtual machine runtime, which is BPF virtual machine. And the virtual machine can also access uh, certain you know, whitelisted kernel functions, helper functions, if you will to implement that you know, functionality. At the same time, there is a key value data st structure called BPF map that is provided to these, uh, to these extensions in the kernel space. And at the same time, the map is also available to the C program, uh, uh, to, the, to the user space, actually, so via a system call. So the user space and the, and the, and the, the bytecode can communicate with each other using eBPF map. Let's look at uh, an example of eBPF, how you can use it. So here, what I'm doing is I'm counting the number of open system calls. So uh, there's, uh, as, as I said, eBPF uh, framework is being used by uh, tracing subsystem in kernel. So there are hooks, and I, I you know, just would add this hook uh, to syscenter open. So my, this is the C program that will execute uh, inside the kernel. And what's going to happen is that we are going to register a map of type array because we want to just count the number of open system calls. Just one uh, uh, entry is enough. The size of um, this counter would be, you know, uh, 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 so uh, since there is only one entry, just uh, 32 uh, bits is enough to locate uh, the entry in the map. And you need a 64-bit counter value. So when, when uh, the open system call is made, the hook is executed, what I'm doing here is I'm just looking up in the map to get this entry using the key, which is just because there's only single element. And, um, and I'm incre incrementing the value for every open system call. And that's how I'm keeping track of number of uh, open system calls. So far, so good. So how can we use eBPF to improve performance of Fuse file system? All right, um, so this is what I developed as a part of my doctoral uh, research at Georgia Tech. Uh, it's called Extended Fuse. Uh, it's extension framework for Fuse file systems. What it does is it basically allows developers, uh, the Fuse file system uh, developers, to also register thin extensions in the kernel. 
So it will have the same interface, just like you, your regular fuse operations. It'll, the interface will be the same, the parameters will be the same. You will register the extensions that you need, uh, and those will be registered in the kernel, and will be handled, will be executed in the kernel, thereby avoiding any context switch to user space. And um, an additional thing that we, we do is, um, I, I provide a special type of uh, BPF maps that are only accessible to the fuse daemon. And they serve as a communication channel between these extensions in the kernel and the fuse daemon in the user space. And what I'm doing here is I'm trying to cache metadata because what the benchmark we saw was heavy on metadata operations, there's a lot of metadata. So what if we could use uh, the BPF maps to cache that metadata and um, the the extensions will be uh, will be uh, will be serving from these cache in the kernel. Hence, there'll be no or very few context switches to user space. So let's look at the architecture of uh, EXT Fuse. Um, so there are two new components um, now. So first is the the lib extended fuse. Similar to lib fuse, I provided a helper library. So that developers, that basically it will hide all the you know, details and provide nice abstractions so that developers have the same interface and can write, you know, easily write their extensions uh, in, in, you know, in C language, which will be, which will be compiled and inserted uh, into the kernel. Obviously it will be verified as part of the BPF, uh, eBPF uh, framework verifier. And uh, this will be done during mount time. So at mount time, so the fuse uh, file system will have two kinds of handlers. One would be uh, the fuse uh, daemon handlers, regular handlers, which exist you know, even today, and those are, you know, and that's actually the slow path. And then uh, there's the second uh, type of handlers, which are extensions now registered into the kernel. So what happens is when the application makes a, a file system call, the, the requests are delivered to the fuse driver, so now the fast path will be taken as opposed to the regular slow path, which is going back to the user space. Since we have registered, uh, we have modified fuse driver, we have registered extensions, the fast path will be taken where the, the corresponding handler will be executed. For example, if it's fuse open request, then open um, handler will be executed. If it's fuse lookup, then lookup handler will be executed. And so that will be the first, uh, path that taken inside the kernel. And that's when the, the handler that has been implemented by these you know, developers, file system developers, will check if, if, the, if the entry that you're trying to look up is already available if, you know, in eBPF map, it's already cached. If it is, then it will serve from the cache. Similarly, if there are uh, attributes that are already cached in eBPF map, then those will be served from the map. And if they are not, then the regular slow path will be taken where the control will again go to fuse daemon. And at that point, since the control is to, you know, uh, given to fuse daemon, that means that the attributes were not cached, the entries were you know, not cached. And that time, the fuse daemon can, using system calls, since it can interact with the eBPF map, can insert or cache uh, metadata in eBPF map so that the future future requests are served right in the kernel. So uh, let's look at example of uh, EXT fuse. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I've, there is a handler for get get attribute uh, kernel uh, kernel extension, which will really serve cached attributes. So for that we need to first cache attributes you know from fuse team. So we define a map. It's of type hash now because for each node ID, you know, file uh, directory, we need to find the corresponding attributes. So the key size is the inode of the, the identifier of the file or directory, and the value would be really what is expected by the fuse driver. What is it, uh, so that it's, it, it returns, it populates additional you know, data structures and returns the final value to VFS and it goes to the application. So fuse attribute out is expected by the fuse driver. And um, so what I've done here is I've created a map of uh, so many entries, two to 16. And 
when, when the request is delivered um, to the fuse driver, the get extended request, the first path that is taken is the fast path. So the get extended um, kernel extension here will be executed. What I'm doing here is I'm first reading the parameters, right? So just allow you, just how you know um, you read the parameters in user space uh, in fuse daemon, you would read parameters here uh, to to basically find out what the what the inode number is, right? Which is the key into this map. So based on the key, you would find if the value is cached or not in the map. If it is cached, then you would simply write the the value here, which is really what is expected by the fuse driver. Hence, this if if what you what you're looking for is is cached, then then this will be served from the kernel, and there'll be no context switches. All right. Uh, okay. So now we are we are caching, you know, in the kernel. It's all good. But what about stale entries? What about invalidations? So it's really the responsibility of the developer to provide the right handler, right extensions in the kernel, so that the cached stale attributes are, are invalidated. For example, if, uh, so what's going to invalidate a cached at, uh, attribute? It'll be maybe a set attribute, you know, a function uh, that is, or, or request that is issued to, to VFS. That's when you know that you're trying to change one of these attributes and it doesn't make sense to cache those attributes anymore in the kernel. So the developer would register a set attribute handler uh, or the kernel extension. Again, what I'm doing here is I'm just reading the inode um, number from, the, from you know, the parameters that fuse driver provided to this extension handler. And I'm just deleting the element from the map. And because it's the, f it's because the fast path is the first path that is taken inside the kernel now, there are no race conditions because, um, because the, the future request will go to the user space only after going through this. So if you have invalidated the stale attributes here, there'll be no more race conditions. So similarly, you can, so, so this was an example of how you can cache and invalidate um, attributes, but you can also cache lookup replies and extended attributes and even symlinks. All right, so let's look at the performance of uh, extended fuse and compare it to regular and optimized fuse. So you, I'm using the same kernel compilation benchmark, same machine, same version of libfuse, uh, and this graph compares native, regular, optimized, and extended fuse on x-axis, y-axis, reports the build time. And as you can see, there is, uh, the, the, the overhead reduces from 17.54% to 5.71%, which is good. However, because we are caching replies in the kernel, and I, I, I really used a large uh, map, so I used 2 to 16 entries, uh, but if you were to use a smaller map and ma efficiently maintain the cache, um, then um, you know, depending upon your you know, cache, caching algorithm, you would see the overhead being you know, increasing, it will basically increase from 5.71 to you know, something like seven or eight. Uh, so if you really use a large cache or maintain it efficiently, only then you'll see performance improvement. Um, and here, because I'm using a large cache, uh, there'll be worst case 50 MB of uh, memory consumption because I'm, 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 um, I'm caching lookup requests Attrib get attribute replies and also extended attributes. Um, so why do we see this improvement? So to, to understand that, let's again uh, look at the number of requests that are delivered to fuse daemon in each of these cases. So I've compared um, regular optimized and extended fuse. X axis shows the, number, uh, the type of request and Y axis shows the number of requests in thousands. As you can see, in case of extended fuse, there are very few get attribute requests because we were able to successfully cache them and in timely invalidate them. Um, by the way, because the the read because the the read request invalidates a time, what needs to happen to be able to successfully cache uh, and serve attributes in the kernel is the read handler in the user space after the read is done, needs to insert those new attributes again in the cache so that the future 
requests are served from the, from the cache, from the map. And similarly, there are very few extended attribute requests. For, for example, if, uh, if the file system does not implement, uh, doesn't have security you know, labels, then it will be as simple as you know, caching the you know, ENO data required. All right, uh, so, okay, so what can we use this for? So like I, you know, in this presentation, I give an example of how you can cache and invalidate metadata in the, in the kernel and hence reduce the number of context switches. Um, this actually applies to all uh, Fuse file system and could be, you know, potentially a part of the libfuse. Uh, um, similarly, we can, I'm, this is something I'm exploring. Can you also cache, uh, read, the uh, results that you know that happens in, in cluster, so where where you you would cache those um, replies in the in the kernel, you know, as sort of, you know, as an optimization, and future uh, uh, read directory uh, requests are served from the kernel. Another example or use case of this would be uh, to perform custom filtering or permission checks. So I gave an example of SDGAR FS as uh, a popular Fuse file system. What it does is it implements custom security checks on top of um, ext4 file system. And those checks are primarily UID based. So they will check the app ID, they'll compare, you know, uh, they'll, they, so it maintains a list of all the apps uh, installed in a packages.list file, which is um, really kept as a hash uh, table. And because we have this ebpf map here, you can insert all those uh, uh, app ID, app name in the ebpf map and, and enforce uh, UID based uh, checks in, in lookup and, um, and, and open. So you can also, ha um, you can also add, um, you can also basically add, um, uh, you can use kernel helper functions so that you can get UID from the kernel, you can get the name of the application in the kernel. Finally, um, this is again uh, a work in progress. Uh, what I'm exploring is, uh, can you use BPF code to directly, to bypass the, to, to bypass the fuse daemon and directly go to the lower file system if the file system is stackable? So can you install, once you open the file in, in user space, can you install the FD in the kernel using the eBPF in a safe manner so that the future read write requests are directly sent to the lower file system as opposed to sending back to the user space. So like I said, this is a, a work in progress uh, at Georgia Tech. Uh, we are applying this to Android, Luster, and even NKFS. Um, there's a project page, it's not, it's not populated now. I've submitted an academic paper. Uh, this is what I was working on, but uh, in maybe next uh, couple of weeks, I will be I'll be uh, populating this page. You know, just adding all the code and you know everything that I have. So what I'm looking for uh, from you guys is, is uh, you know any feedbacks, any suggestions that you may have, and I I think this will be this will potentially help a lot of Fuse file systems. Thank you. And I'll be happy to take any questions. So you said that uh, read requests are uh, clearing the cache from the kernel. Have you tested with no uh, no access time, no time for the mount options? So it, uh, yes, I did, and it turns out that Fuse does not uh, honor no a time, and they have their own reasons. I forgot why, but uh, if you specify if you you mount using no a time, it doesn't really honor mm -hmm. that. Uh, the other question is: Have you dropped the caches between the tests? Can I drop caches between the tests? Yes. Um, have you tested with dropping caches? Uh, no. What I've tested is uh, with a smaller ca BPF map size, so as opposed to two raised to sixteen, maybe you know just five hundred twelve entries, and I did not really see a lot of improvement. Mm -hmm. And I was just there was no efficient algorithm to manage the cache. But I, I, I believe that if there was an algorithm to you know even so if you have a smaller cache and a better uh, efficient algorithm to manage that cache, you would still see performance improvements. Okay, and last question. Have you tested with a kernel with KPTI? A kernel with? Uh, kernel page table isolation. Uh, oh, yes. Protection from meltdown. Yeah, so this is something, um, you know, uh, that I plan to do. I haven't tested that. Uh, but uh, I, I think you, you, you bang on. I think uh, you would, because 
now there are you know, more uh, context switches, you would expect something different. And I, I'll post the results soon. This is something I want to do, yes. Hello, my Hi. question is uh, what kind of synchronization mechanism you used in uh, this work and how it's scalable in terms of number of CPU cores, how it works if you have really, really many CPU cores? Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, did, did you use global kernel queues lock for all operations or you made fine grain fi locking or any other type I of see. Me mechanisms? So I really did not use any, any locking. It was part of the eBPF framework. So when you are about to execute uh, the handler or one of those extensions in the kernel, uh, the, f the framework takes RCU lock, and that's how it protects. So I really did not have to just uh, do that. I just, I, so whatever was being used for tracing and network subsystem, I was, you know, you, I used that as an inspiration and just added, uh, so use the RCB lock. But no, no global locks are taken. Yes. So um, have you considered like other cases uh, in BPF other than caching? Because BPF you can implement a very complicated, uh, or maybe not very, but complicated uh, use cases. And maybe like uh, in the extreme case, you probably can implement a huge amount of your like a file system just all in BPF. Uh, you consider those cases or? So, so you're, you're right. So, so what, what, I'm, what I'm proposing here is a framework. So it's up to the developer and their you know, effort and their imagination to really come up with a complicated case. But you're absolutely right. So depending on how you know uh, improved eBPF gets over the time, it's you know started with uh, you know restricted. Now it is evolving. So you pr perhaps could have a, a, a full you know maybe a restrictive file system functionality in the kernel without anything in the user space. In, in fact, this is something that I'm trying with um, uh, with, with Android. Uh, if, if is it possible to push all the Android you know custom checks in the kernel as part of eBPF as opposed to? Uh, but I'm not I'm not sure at this point. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi. So, Hi. with your uh, library add-on, uh, does the author of the Fuse file system have to do anything special, or do they just use your library and it's automatic? They get this caching. Um, so th they, okay. Um, so there will be a, a flag that says, okay, now the Fuse driver supports uh, um, supports um, I, uh, the extended Fuse framework. But I believe, lo and, and so since the, the handlers are written by developers, it can be an external library. And the flag can also be moved into init, where the, the init function of the Fuse file system uh, or the Fuse daemon can really test if the, if the functionality is present in the kernel and enable that and then insert those extensions. So I would suspect uh, very few. Uh, we, I mean, I think less than maybe you know, uh, 50 lines of code, if anything. Uh, so I have a very specific question. So for your uh, example, uh, uh, you use the BPF map as a cache, but it's a fixed uh, size storage. So what is your caching strategy and like does the BPF side controls like the eviction or the user side controls the caching strategy? So I really did not get time to come up with a very you know, efficient um, you know, caching mechanism. I really haven't evaluated that uh, you know, deeply, but uh, but I just use a fixed size. But uh, this is something that I want to do just for every you know, different sizes, how does the performance change. I, I tested the compilation benchmark you know, uh, briefly with, with the smaller cache, but I did not come up with an efficient way of uh, invalidating and maintaining the cache. But if you do that, I think you will see improvements. I w want to understand how does this pro pro uh, profit happen. Uh, as I understood, you uh, get profit because you cache uh, fuse under um, fuse get other requests. 
type, yes? Yeah. yeah. This kind of, uh, command. Uh, when you uh, firstly read uh, inode, you read, uh, you store it in stru structure inode, uh, which is uh, which is in container used inode. Uh, it's already cached. Uh, why? What is the reason? It's not enough, and uh, in uh, plain fuse uh, mode, you request, uh, you do fuse re get other request again. Why it's not enough? That's a very good question, and thank you for asking this question. This gives me an opportunity to highlight why you need, uh, you know, custom checks. So uh, there was uh, a case um, sometime back where. Um, uh, it was identified that the, the, uh, you're right, absolutely right. The inodes and the entries are cached in the kernel, right? But it's it, what what's happening is it's done for uh, the first user. It's really there is no UID based checks. So if if the if you want to implement custom permission checks, uh, it really cannot happen because the 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 inode that is now cached by the kernel was tested for first user, and you really cannot invalidate for next user. So only with this sort of framework where developers can add their custom logic, can they really uh, implement custom checks? That does make sense? Uh, you mean uh, additional checks which happen, uh, which occur at open time or something? Uh, uh, Lookup time, open time, there could be additional permission checks. Uh, I mean uh, that views are not is not being invalidated at close time. It's still living uh, for a while, still um, requiring time. So um, when, uh, when you first time uh, get uh, I not, you do all the checks. Isn't this? So when you do the second open and uh, uh, you can perform the checks again, in, and uh, uh, if it's impossible, you won't believe the cache that I know. Uh, um, so what I'm saying is that, that b so the suffused so model currently, what the, what the driver does, you know, if you enable the, you know, if you specify no non-zero entry timeout, they'll cache entries based on, you know, the, the first user that is using and using the permissions for that user. If the user were to change, right, so that's one way, one example where the, the cached model does not, you know, uh, suffice. Another example where, uh, so the current model that kernel has is all uh, reactive caching. So you, you first request, you know, it goes through the slow path, you cache it, and now it's in the kernel. So this can have proactive caching. So for example, you can, before you, you, you so developers know what, what um, you know, a, uh, attributes, what entries will be accessed, so they can cache beforehand. For example, the cluster reader, uh, a head requ request, right? Okay. Okay. Maybe we can take that, that offline if I'm missing something. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Great. Uh, any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so thank much. Thank the audience for great questions.